economic growth was around 8% in Nigeria last year and uh, around 6% plus this year. Non-oil non growth is projected at 8% this year, I believe, leveling off to a healthy 7% over the next few years. You can almost touch the jealousy from Europe and across the Atlantic. <laughs> With inflation still high at 10% but declining, the annual fiscal deficit plummeting last year and banking reform moving slowly but steadily, macroeconomic and fiscal management is admirably on track. But one does not rest on one's laurels, as the saying goes. And there are problems. Risks from volatile oil prices, caution in favor of caution. Above all, however, Nigerian industrial structures have meant that wealth and income are narrowly distributed, which is almost always a contributor to political and social instability and divisiveness. Unemployment by some measures is actually rising, especially amongst the young. These are dangers ahead. Recent political history and Nigerian political structures don't help. Ten years ago, I gave a speech in this room on the subject of investment, competition and regulatory reform and private sector growth. Not a rare topic in these hallowed buildings. <laughs> to an extent since then, the deals and the transactions have dominated reforms. A kind of Chinese-style opening up and reliance and competition have received less attention. The result is that the public may not have benefited from liberalization as much as they should. Proper regulatory reform should result in rapid grassroots economic expansion. Anyone been to a Chinese city lately? The general public benefit should come alongside short-term pain like subsidy reductions, which I believe in the petrol sector are about uh, getting on for $1,000 per year for every adult in the nation. The general public benefit should come alongside these benefits as a concerted, smart political strategy of the state. Competition should be there to bring very rapid investment, for example, after subsidies are phased out. However, fortunately, the so-called global recession is not really global. Most of the world is growing fast and there's a lot of capital to be invested. China, Brazil, Southeast Asia, Turkey, Germany, Australia, and so on. Nigerians hold billions of dollars in overseas uh, funds waiting to be invested back home. There is a lot of capital looking for a home, but Nigeria is not getting its proportional share of non-oil international investment. Neither is it fully benefiting from opportunities for investment in Nigeria's hydrocarbon sector. Higher growth rates are desirable, but better distributed growth is an utter political as well as economic necessity in Nigeria. And it is the path to greater and more pluralistic investment. That is why the new wave of reforms is so critical now. Reforms to industrial structures which see wider distributed growth. Primary among such reforms is what you call deregulation, aimed at broadening and deepening economic participation and ending what some call the culture of exclusion based on rent extraction. Say that first thing in the morning. But what is deregulation and how did we get to a point where we needed to deregulate? Indeed, can it be done? with so many people perceiving potential loss from the reforms. Is deregulation all about removing legitimate protections for the public and reducing wages? Do reformers seek a wild west, a country of anarchy? The key point is that deregulation is today in Nigeria a key task, but it is not an objective. 
Higher quality of regulation is the ultimate objective. The economy and the market are games with rules. Bad rules or no rules means not only lower growth, but growth which is captured by the relative few. Russia, for example, has both simultaneously. To achieve economic reform aims, the real objective is to improve the quality of the rules, the quality of regulation. It so happens that one of the problems in Nigeria is that there is too much regulation, hence the prioritization. We hope in the future to regard this as a temporary post-colonial glitch. There are still too many permissions, too many licensing needs, too many decisions made by officials on how many market entrants are allowed to be in the sector. In many sectors and local communities, economic competition is weak. Import licenses in many sectors, coupled with near impossibility of obtaining licenses to produce locally, lead to high prices, lack of choice, and lack of investment. And they lead to a country where 60% plus of the population still experience poverty. It's only water. Contrary to rumor. But the quantity of regulation is but one quality attribute. There are others. A second quality attribute is that economic regulation should be equally applied and with administrative discretion narrow or non-existent. Regulation should be minimal for the achievement of the public interest. Government regulation should not exist where it is unnecessary, where insurances, for example, can deal with risk or where customers and competitors can do the job. Does every business need a license and have to jump through hoops and pay to get it? Economic regulation should be easy to understand, easy to find out about, and at the lowest efficient cost both to enforce and to comply with. Economic regulation should not result in the creation of significant monopoly power and should not create monopolies, even in infrastructure and even by accident. Regulation should not be all about the rights of government but also about the rights of the public and the economy. For example, the right not to be refused a license if prior conditions are met. Governments, whose departments tend to operate in silos, as we all know, should judge the quality of regulation by how they work together on people and companies to inhibit or help economic activity when they're all applied together to its subjects, or some might say, to its victims. Of course, <laughs> indeed, of course, Nigerians know better than I how a culture of overregulation develops its own momentum. I am hopefully speaking truth to power when I say that incentives do exist to create new regulations and apply them awkwardly with wide discretion so as to maximize rent income. This is indeed a global phenomenon. The trick is to turn this down spiral into an up spiral where better regulation creates more investment and more formal small businesses, which strengthens political pressure to further improve the quality of regulations. It is a stark fact that in China, as in the UK, the majority of formal employment is in small businesses. This is not so in Nigeria, and the relative small size of the private SME sector is a key symptom of the need for regulatory reform and indeed an inhibitor to larger scale investment. Small companies need, large companies need small companies and vice versa. But often it helps when mustering the courage to continue reforms in the face of resistance to remember how we got here in the first place. First, we had the historic centralization born of colonial preference. Colonists, prefer one overall leader to do deals with. And don't I know that from my current experiences in the Mideast, South Asia, and Afghanistan.